Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Last week, a joint Ugandan and Congolese military operation killed more than 100 militants of a supposedly Islamic group. It is said that the group was responsible for killing 14 UN peacekeepers in early December. The attack on the UN peacekeepers was one of the worst such ever attacks in the history of the UN, and it briefly called attention to this part of Central Africa. Unknown to most, the Democratic Republic of Congo is currently also experiencing one of the world's worst, worst res refugee crises. According to Internal Displacement Monitoring Organization, 1.7 million people have been forced to flee their homes in 2017 because of the conflict in the Congo. This makes the Congo's internal displacement greater than those in Yemen, Syria, or Iraq. Joining me to shed some light on the ongoing conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo is Helen Epstein. Helen is visiting professor of public health and human rights at Bard College and is the author most recently of Another Fine Mess, America, Uganda, and the War on Terror. She has also worked as a consultant for many international organizations, including UNICEF and Human Rights Watch, and writes frequently about Africa for the New York Review of Books and other publications. Thanks for joining us today, Helen. My pleasure. Helen, let's start with the um, attack against the uh, UN peacekeepers. They were all Tanzanians, the 15 that were killed early this month. What exactly happened in that case? Well, it seems as though at about five o'clock uh, in the afternoon on December 7th, uh, hundreds of um, um, militants stormed the, a, uh, a detachment of Tanzanian peacekeepers in um, in uh, a region known as Beni in Eastern Congo, which has seen um, a great deal of instability over the past uh, three years, in fact. Um, and this is just the culminating event in a long series of horrific massacres, mostly against civilians in that area. Um, but this has really been going on for some time. And what's particularly uh, puzzling about this particular attack is it, um, it's been widely attributed to a group called the Allied Democratic Forces that um, have been operating in the region for over 20 years and uh, originally came from Uganda. But many local sources are skeptical that the Allied Democratic Forces could have been responsible for these attacks because um, most accounts suggest that uh, the um, ADF is really on its last legs and really consists of only a uh, hundred fighters or so at most uh, who really don't have uh, great sources of support. So the question really is uh, quite open as to who was responsible for this attack. It's worth noting that they seem to be wearing Congolese uh, army uniforms, um, as have many of the other attackers in previous massacres. So. Um, that might give one a clue as to what's going on. So what is it, what do we know about the ADF and why would uh, the Congolese and Ugandan uh, military attack them and kill a hundred of their members? Well, it's very hard to get a handle on exactly what's going on in this region. Um, according to the Ugandans, they attacked the um, alleged ADF because the ADF has long uh, professed a desire to overthrow the government of Yoweri Museveni in Uganda. Um, but it's, um, and that uh, they were afraid that the ADF, this was an opening uh, move in this uh, somehow was connected, this attack on the peacekeepers was connected to that mission somehow. But it really doesn't make sense because the ADF for the most part, um, hasn't at attempted to attack Uganda since the late 1990s. And it's really quite unclear uh, whether that really happened. What Uganda is actually doing uh, in Congo may be quite different from what it says it's doing. Yeah, actually, let's take a step back and uh, give us maybe a brief overview as to what is going on in, uh, in the region. I mentioned earlier that up to 1.7 million Congolese are internally displaced at the moment. So wh what are the main conflicts uh, and uh, what are the main factions in this conflict? Well, there are actually conflicts uh, all over 
uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. But in this particular region, something very peculiar has been going on uh, in the past, uh, really since about October 2014, uh, which um, the summer of 2014 really seemed as though it was a, there was a kind of lull uh, in the troubles there. The ADF, so-called, which was already on its last legs, uh, had re really been sort of summarily uh, smashed by the Uga by the Congolese army in um, about six months before, and everything seemed sort of peaceful. And then suddenly, in October, there was a spate uh, of, of terrible, terrible, senseless, incredibly brutal massacres. Uh, broke out in that region. And they've been going on sporadically in uh, villages around the area, around this whole area known as Beni, um, ever since. And nobody can quite predict when they're going to happen, uh, despite the fact that there are uh, about 20,000 uh, soldiers deployed in the region, as well as the largest peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping mission in the world. For some reason, uh, those forces, as well as the police and intelligence services of Congo, have been unable to prevent these horrific massacres. And what typically happens, according to um, accounts of lo by local witnesses, is that very often um, people who look like soldiers will actually turn up in a village wearing Congolese army uniforms, tell, gain people's confidence by saying, um, we're here to protect you. Uh, we hear there's, uh, you know, there's some militants in the region and so on. And then once everyone's kind of relaxed and sort of their guard is down, suddenly these very same individuals in army uniforms will begin massacring people. And witnesses say that some of those people are, uh, do seem to be um, members of the Allied Democratic Forces. But and then in many cases, uh, members of the Congolese military are also involved and sometimes seem to be carrying out the most brutal attacks. So in some cases, they, um, it seems as though they're just uh, doing this um, for no reason, as though they're just trying to kind of demonstrate how brutal they can be. So they'll slaughter the men first to get them out of the way so they can't protect anyone else, force everyone else to watch that. And then uh, one by one, uh, work their way through the women, children, and the elderly, and even health workers. It's a, a ghastly situation. And as I said, this has been going on for three years, and we know almost nothing about it. I mean, or we rather we hear almost nothing about it. Local people, of course, know a great deal about what's going on. But there's been a kind of strange silence about it, despite the fact that uh, it has indeed caused the f um, hundreds of thousands of people in this area to flee their homes. Uh, where they then need to be taken care of by charities in the international community when they were once until very recently supporting themselves as farmers. It's a, it's a, it's a dreadful situation. To what extent can one say that uh, <clears throat> natural resource uh, uh, acquisition and uh, exploitation is uh, at the heart of this? I mean, it is well known that that part of Africa is uh, is uh, a area that is very rich in natural resources of all kinds. Uh, to what extent do you, would you say is, is that fueling what's going on there right now? That's, uh, many people are scratching their heads and wondering if that's not the case um, as to what's going on. It's worth noting a couple things. One of them is that some of the people involved in these attacks, especially the ones in Congolese army uniforms, it turns out that um, over uh, both Congo and, um, oh, sorry, both Rwanda and um, Uganda have, uh, since the early beginning in the mid 1990s, uh, they uh, invaded Congo, this particular region of Congo, and really occupied the area for many years. They, uh, their main armies left in 2003 after a peace deal was signed. But they've continued to support proxy forces in the region that have been involved in um, uh, trafficking and resources and also in um, um, horrific human rights abuses against the population. And as part of the various settlements over, over time, peace deals have also been enacted with these groups. And as condition of those peace deals, some of them have been integrated into the Congolese army. And it's thought that those 
people, actually, these sort of um, former rebel combatants uh, seem to be uh, involved in the current attacks. And what they're doing is not um, clear. There is a great deal of oil underneath um, the surface of Beni. And Uganda is, these are oil fields that are actually linked to Uganda and uh, Uganda's oil fields, which Uganda is currently exploiting. And so um, that's worth bearing in mind. And so, um, but there, but it's also the case that um, uh, large numbers of, of peasants seem to be arriving um, many of them from Rwanda saying that they are Congolese refugees who are now returning from Rwanda to settle back in their lands. But um, these people, uh, many of them don't actually speak Swahili very well, which is the lingua franca of Congo. And so some people are kind of wondering, they speak very good Kenya Rwanda. So people are wondering if they're really Congolese or they perhaps um, Rwandans that are being settled there as a sort of de facto way of occupying this incredibly lucrative area, which also happens to be kind of at the crossroads of the illegal trade in um, gold and timber and ivory and uh, especially coltan, which is um, the raw material of cell phones and computer chips. So whoever has possession of this particular area really controls the trade in that and all of those materials and therefore um, can do extremely well. So. But exactly what's going on, unfortunately, um, we really don't know. Um, but that's I just want, what I yeah. I just want to turn briefly to uh, the politics within uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, Joseph Kabila, the current president of the DRC, has uh, postponed elections that were supposed to take place last year. And he said he would leave by the end of the year, but so far remains in place. What is happening here and what effect does this uh, lack of uh, a, an election and the conflicts that is the, the political situation in, in uh, the DRC, what effect is that having on the conflict uh, and the displacement within the Congo? Uh, it's a huge problem, actually, uh, because in addition to these um, rather more mercenary activities and motivations that uh, seem to be at play in Eastern Congo and in other regions of the country. Uh, there is also um, um, a protest movement, an up, uh, sort of various uprisings all around the country that are trying to recruit members um, to try to move against Kabila and uh, persuade him to step down. And so the country is really fracturing and it makes it very difficult for um, uh, uh, really to find credible leaders, especially in this region, but anywhere who can um, try to sort these problems out. So um, the country is really turning into a kind of terrible lawless frontier. And it's extremely tragic because the international community um, has for a very long time, particularly in the Eastern Congo situation, been very, very forgiving, particularly of Uganda and Rwanda, which have uh, been the recipients of vast amounts of development and military aid over the years, uh, but which continue to meddle militarily in this region and uh, creating enormous upheavals for millions of people, really. And um, so the international community, as far as I can tell, is not really helping. Um, and the Trump administration has so far given uh, um, Joseph Kabila another year in power in Congo, but that doesn't seem uh, before who knows what they will then do. It's not really clear. Um, but in the meantime, um, uh, more mayhem will reign and more um, more different sort of groups will try to take advantage of the situation to advance whatever interest they may have. Okay, well, we'll uh, continue to keep an eye on this, of course, and uh, and then we'll probably come back to you. I was speaking to Helen Epstein, Professor of Public Health and Human Rights at Bard College. Thanks for having joined us today, Helen. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Take care.
And thank you for joining The Real News Network. If you like our news and analysis, please don't forget to donate to The Real News this holiday season.